Funding for this program was provided in part by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University. We welcome you to another discussion of the scriptures. We're studying the Doctrine and Covenants, and joining us today are Matthew Richardson, uh, Professor of Church History and Doctrine, John Livingston, Professor of Church History and Doctrine, and Stephen Harper, Professor of Church History and Doctrine, and I'm Guy Dorius from the Department of Church History and Doctrine. Today we're going to be discussing sections 7 and 13, and uh, Matt, Matthew, why don't you set us up for section 7 and, and uh, kind of give us a context of where we're at in the scriptures. Okay. Section 7 and both section 7 and 13 are actually two of the 15 revelations that are published that Joseph received in Harmony, Pennsylvania, which of course is where Emma Smith is from. And so while they're there in section 7, this really is an outcome of a discussion between Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery. One of the interesting things I think about this section is that it really has the spirit of the Doctrine and Covenants behind it, that the notion of inquiry, discussion, hey, what do you think about this? Mm, gee, I, I don't know, let's go ask. And apparently you have a discussion between Oliver and Joseph regarding a section of John in the New Testament, chapter 21, primarily verses 21 to the end, discussing the status of John the Beloved, a discussion between Peter and the Savior. And, and apparently there was some, uh, I don't know if debate's too strong of a word, but a, a, a discussion between Joseph and Oliver about the, the status of John the Beloved. And so the inquiry came, let's go and ask. And so through the Urim and Thummim, they uh, received section seven, which by the way, the Times and Seasons reported this as a translation. And you can read this in your heading of section seven is translated version of a record made on parchment by John and hidden up by himself. And so there you have section seven is really almost settling this discussion between Joseph and Oliver about the status of John the Beloved. You know, it almost sounds like a couple of missionaries, you know, out in the mission field. It's night after tracting or something like that. They sit down and they start to talk and wonder. And But these brethren had a Urim and Thummim. And uh, so they go after it. What an interesting way to be able to do that. I w I've often wondered if this, if this question also came out of uh, I, I'm not certain if I know where they were in the translation of the Book of Mormon at this time, but uh, if that came out of their uh, translation questions, again, the Doctrine and Covenants is full of those. Uh, in that process of translating scripture, it spurs that revelation, like well, you said. By the time you come to section 13, there's no doubt about it. The questions are arising whether or not it comes directly from the translation right. text right. or whether it's related items. Um, questions about authority are going to be coming down. And, and surely they must have been discussing these items between themselves. Sometimes we look at it as a sterile environment is, is translate, translate, write, 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 without any discussion. That seems really quite unlikely. And I think section seven points that out. And these are real men with real personalities. And just as we would sit down with a friend and go over things, how, I, wouldn't it be fascinating to see the real video of how those discussions Well, and went? how often in your classes you're discussing <coughs> section seven or, or if you're in the... Uh, if you're in the uh, Book of Mormon, the three Nephites, John, John the Beloved, those to, to students today are still fascinating topics. What does it mean to be translated? What, what, what does that mean? And so uh, I think you're right. I think these are uh, people like we are. Curiosity peaks and they ask questions. And they, I think we might assume they had a purer way of finding out, but I think we all can ask those kinds of questions uh, of it. Speaking of questions, I think it's interesting. If you look right at verse 1, here's the Lord asking John the Revelator a question. Oh, my goodness. If you and I were asked this question, you know, John, my beloved, what desirest thou? For if you ask what you will, it shall be granted unto you. Oh, my goodness. You know, we in our society, we talk about fairy godmothers and things like that, but it appears that the Lord from time to time will ask one of his servants what they would like with some assurance that he'll give them anything. I mean, what would you ask for? It's reminiscent of the passage, I think, is in the 10th chapter of Helaman, 
where Nephi is given this um, marvelous license by the Lord to ask for whatever he wants because the Lord makes clear he will ask right. He will ask for what the Lord wants. And John has arrived at this place in his life where what he desires is what the Lord desires. Notice what John wants. He wants to uh, prophesy, preach before nations. He wants to remain on the earth to continue the work, the apostolic work that he's begun. I just quickly turned to chapter 10 in Helaman. This is where he's, of course, talking to Helaman. I'm sorry, Nephi, the son of Helaman. And uh, boy, just listen to this. Uh, I will bless thee forever. I will make thee mighty in word and in deed, in faith and in works, yea, even that all things shall be done unto thee according to thy word. Whoa, for thou shalt not ask that which is contrary to my will. Boy, you know, you just wonder sort of what the setup is for when the Lord would give you whatever he wants. And it sounds like it must have something to do about, you know, when you come to the point where you would not do something that would be contrary to the Lord's will at all. What, whatever you would ask for is is safe in the universe. So I think speak. that's important is Steve brings up is asking for what's right and you look at verse 3 as Steve was reading but go back to verse 2 and I said unto him Lord give unto me power over death. Some people might stop reading right there and say see that's what I want I want to live forever but I, and I think this is very important to section 7 and in any other discussion dealing with for example the three Nephites is why, and sometimes I like to enter, uh, you know, put a little so right there, power over death, so that I may live and bring souls unto thee. That's, that's what he's really after. Extend my mission that I might bring souls unto thee. It's not just the fascination of not dying and, and all the stories sometimes, folklore, traditions, we talk about these experiences with three Nephites, John the Beloved, etc. Their mission is, or his desire, and their mission would be to bring souls unto Christ. Christ and an extended mission there. And even more than an extension, I mean, he wants to do missionary work forever. That's right. You know, and, and most of us as missionaries, you know, often we get excited. We'd like to be extended a month or three or a something, month or but so, yeah. John is not talking about a month or three. He wants to live forever. That well, he can and, bring and it ties us into a theme that we'll see continued through the Doctrine and Covenants, and that is all of our mission is to bring souls to Christ. We don't use maybe the same language to prophesy before nations. We preach before nations, or we we teach our neighbors or, or whoever and that and we'll see that as a continuing theme so so in a sense i think in in one way the lord is tying the past to the present for joseph and oliver which they would really appreciate is that in the past this was their duty even with those who i uh, allowed to remain and in the present that will be your duty and oliver's already been told that in section six previously and so 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 that crying repentance theme comes out now uh, well, I find in section 7 also interesting is the interplay between these very human uh, characters here. Peter, uh, y you get the idea here in verse 4, and for this cause the Lord said unto Peter, if I will that he shall tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Uh, you almost get a sense that Peter wondered if if he shouldn't have asked for the same thing. Uh, don't we all do that once in a while? Ooh, did, did I ask the right for the right thing that I want to go and be with the Savior, which would all of us want to do that too. And, and, and there's almost a jealousy, you almost sense a jealousy there. And, and if Peter was the senior apostle, maybe he got asked first, right? Right, right. So, so, he, so he gives his response, and then when John comes, that. yeah. Yeah, oh, did I miss right. the chance to give the good answer? Uh, <laughs> yeah. And I think that's a very human insight into great uh, men of the past. Uh, we kind of get a little pure insight than we might have in the Bible. Uh, through this and exchange. I think it's wonderful too that we see real men with real issues, real concerns. It's kind of satisfying that the Lord can work with someone like that. And if he can work with someone like that, well, maybe he can work with someone like me. This seldom read uh, explanatory introduction to the Doctrine and Covenants emphasizes uh, that these revelations were given to real people in real life situations. And understanding those personalities and their context enhances very much what we get from the revelations that revealed. I don't think that, that um, this is contradictory, but um, I, th I think that in some ways we, we shouldn't sell Peter short either. Yeah. Because it says, for example, in verse 5, what you have asked is a good desire. Uh, um, what John has asked is a greater, perhaps it could even be a prolonged work. That's right. Because there's no doubt about it, and this is almost cheating from our perspective because we have hindsight, is there's the, the hand of Peter in the restorative period 
even what we're studying here is going to be keenly felt as you go through the remainder of these uh, of these revelations. But but here it comes down and it says um, what you desired is good. But John has a different mission and, and, and it's prolonged. It is a it's a great desire. And then we see that validated in verse seven again is don't forget is I will make thee to minister for him and for thy brother, James. And so Peter still has this notion of he's ministering to John and yeah. to James. You know, it's really a, well, what, an what interesting the, thing of, of the teaching, the nurturing, the massaging yeah. of, of his leaders. Isn't the Lord, yeah, the Lord's trying to kind of get them out of the thing I think a lot of us suffer from, and that is, that is competition, pride. Yeah. Uh, have I asked the right thing? We all have different missions. And calling. even in church callings, uh, you know, is the nursery as good as, as the, the uh, bishopric? And right. certainly we always say with our tongues it is. But I, I, think, I think the Lord's trying to teach you. Yeah, you ask a good thing, he asks a good thing, different things, both good, and we still have mission ahead to perform. And I, I agree with that. That's a, and I think sometimes we misinterpret the greater work as being he asks a better thing. And I think you're right. I'm not sure that's what it, that means. And that's one thing I love about seven is it, it, it really blends those three individuals back together in one for really, we could go back to verse two, to bring souls unto thee. And We'll see, you'll see this when you study section 46 is the notion of gift of the spirits that they benefit all. And it's that competitive notion that guy you were talking about is rather than competitive, we look at the blending of and all are benefited and all come to Christ. So this is a fascinating experience where you have real people, real revelation and how, how God can bring man to, or men and women to him and put them together as one. Great if, stuff. If you come back to verse three, look at right in the middle there. You know, because thou desirest this, it's almost as if the Lord really does want to bless us according to our desires. John desired to do this particular thing. Peter desired to do something else. Boy, if you knew that the Lord would give you about whatever you wanted, would you want the right stuff? Yeah. It's those kinds of words that uh, reveal how the revelations locate agency. The Lord uses revelation uh, in one sense to put power or agency, which are equated in a later revelation, into us. John here gets to decide what he desires, and the Lord will grant it. The Lord doesn't grant before we desire. He doesn't force blessings. The commandment is repeated. Ask, and then you'll receive, giving us the opportunity and responsibility to decide for ourselves what we want. In that way, revelation uh, puts an enormous responsibility on us. On the asker, yeah, the person who asks. That, you know, to, to lead us, uh, I've thought a lot about the fact that Joseph and Oliver must have asked a lot of questions. And obviously we don't have the answers to all the questions they ask. So why John? Why is that pertinent? I think uh, to get us to, to section 13 in our discussion, I think uh, Matt brought out a very important point that that uh, James and John and, and uh, Peter have a mission together. Uh, after the death of Christ, they were given a commission, and part of that mission is in Joseph Smith's future. And, and section 13, as we turn to that, is the restoration of priesthood. The Aaronic priesthood, of course, by the hands of a tangible, resurrected being. But now there's going to be a, res, uh, a restoration of the Melchizedek priesthood, and we don't have any scripture to tell us about that, but we do have the three individuals by the history of the church who did that, and that was Peter, James, and John. And I often wonder if this one isn't written so that we as readers and Joseph and, and Oliver had a hint of things to come, that when they weren't surprised by Peter, James, and John on the Susquehanna River, and, and we get to know that John, when John shows up, they kind of know firsthand he's not dead. He's here, and he can t tangibly give us keys, and so uh, yeah, he's here, uh, and he's here as a. When we look at it, some people say, "Well, what status is he in?" And you see that he is in a translated state, you know, as far as that goes, impervious to that of of mortality, yeah. which is answered there. And you bring up something that's very important, and and this is done with hindsight, and this is our benefit. But then I think we have responsibility to carry that over into our own lives. Is is you're bringing up a great segue into transition, which I think is important. Here, here we come back to line upon line precept upon precept, and, and you see this beautifully in the Doctrine and Covenants. I'm laying foundations so that we may move ahead. And I like the way that you said that is, so they're not surprised. 
really they're learning as they go along, but it's not like, oh, I don't know what to do with this information. It's heavenly beings. Oh, well, we've talked about John, come to think of it, and also we were instructed here of the mission of what sometimes the New Testament calls the three pillars, Peter, James, and John, coming with the mission in verse 7 with power and the keys of this ministry. And when we get to section 13, Joseph writes in the history of the church that, that John the Baptist was actually operating under the direction of Peter, James, and John, holders of the priesthood and, and of Melchizedek. And in a culture void of understanding of how keys are administered to... To administer, to administer the kingdom of God, they need this tutoring. They, they, they don't have a seminary to go to. They don't know how they're going to be qualified to, to do this work, and they figure, uh, they're, they're figuring out very quickly it's by angelic ministration. Yeah. And, and it, it's amazing how young they are. You consider that <laughs> Joseph is 24, which now is young to us, right? The, these brethren are younger than any one of us. How old are you, Steve? I don't remember. Steve's yeah. closest, but right. <laughs> and even Peter, James, and John themselves, at the time of the discussion with the Savior that this section's all about, we don't know how old they were, but the Savior's 33 when he dies. We can suspect they're somewhere around that age. Boy, they really are learning. There really is a, 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 a seminary type thing going on here. So probably, you, Steve, did you have anything else uh, on 7? Just we... to note, too, that this is a wonderful text to illustrate another point of the restoration, and that is that the Bible is not the in, uh, infallible, inerrant, complete, it's not an archive of everything God ever said. There are other records, including this one of John, and Joseph as a revelator has access, when the Lord wills it, to those records. So this is, beside the other things we've suggested it is, it's a testimony that there is more and even there, is, there are ancient records that we do not yet have access to. And this little piece of restoration to the 21st chapter of John is one uh, manifestation of that ongoing flood of information. And it's a testimony that the Doctrine and Covenants will provide clarification of existing Scripture. And so we see this harmony working hand in hand and, and all of you teaching the Doctrine and Covenants, how many times are you teaching and you find yourself going back to New Testament, back to Old Testament, and using both to be able to clarify and bring a full fruit. It, it's, it's really beautiful it uh, what's taking place there. And so uh, now with section 13, I guess that would be a tie and why we would put with these together is they are ultimately about restoration of priesthood, obviously section 13 more tangibly so, and, and the context of section 13 is again a question coming out of their translation experience. Really the Book of Mormon is that witness of Christ that we can't, uh, it, we can't overstate how important it is, but in its direction on procedure it lacks. And, and so the brethren are reading about baptism and the necessity of baptism and so they go and ask and uh, and they go where there's baptism uh, capabilities a, a river out the, the back door. out the back door down from the cabin down on the Susquehanna and they go and ask the Lord about baptism and in that context John the Baptist working as, as Matt uh, stated under the direction of Peter James and John comes and restores keys and I, I you know one verse here let's let's read that uh, John do you have that sure. why don't you read that out right loud here. for us upon you my fellow servants in the name of Messiah I confer the priesthood of Aaron which holds the keys of the ministering of angels and of the gospel of repentance and of baptism by immersion for the remission of sins and this shall never be taken again from the earth until the sons of Levi do offer again an offering unto the Lord in righteousness. That's it. That's the whole, the whole context of what happened here and then we know that after that and characteristic of the Lord's direction, he gives them the keys and then tells them to baptize one another using the authority he's just put upon them. Instead of having the messenger do it, he allows them to go forth and do that. So this, in a sense, is a lesson in, in uh, delegation. Uh, one other thing that kind of has always popped out to me is the fact that uh, there is no office uh, referred to in section 13. And sometimes we try to attach priesthood office to this section. And, and I think it's important to realize that this is prior to the restoration of the church. There were no priesthood offices. 
that the priesthood authority is given to baptize. And if they were to hold an office in today's church, it would be that of a priest. But they were not ordained to an office of the priesthood because those offices only exist within the organized church where membership can sustain those offices. And if we think in our sacrament meetings, when we sustain a young man in the Aaronic priesthood, we're sustaining him to hold office in that priesthood, deacon, teacher, or priest. And so, so that's one uh, correction I think uh, should just stand out is that there is no office uh, ordained here. Priesthood is here. conferred. Conferred. It's interesting right. that John brings up the term keys. Right. Mm -hmm. It's important. Yeah. Keys. There's no doubt that receiving the priesthood is one thing, but being a key holder uh, in the priesthood is another. In a way, the, I suppose the bishop is the Aaronic priesthood key holder in the ward. And uh, at this point, there's no Melchizedek priesthood yet, so they've got it. One but, of my students, sorry, John. Go ahead. My students uh, uh, seek a, a way to understand the difference between priesthood and keys. And I sometimes suggest that priesthood is power and keys are permission to use that power. One may possess the power or have rights to the power and yet not have permission to do some of the things that power can do or all the things. That's a great When thing. one has keys, one has permission to receive ministering of angels. I think that one is particularly interesting. We, maybe we can talk about that in a minute. Keys to administer the gospel of repentance, that is to teach faith in Christ, repentance, baptism, and keys to actually administer the baptism by immersion for the remission of sins. You know, those keys I think it's important to look at. That in some ways, um, by the time you come to DNC section 84, which is often recognized as the priesthood section, it mentions this in DNC section 84, verse 26. And the lesser priesthood continued, which priesthood holdeth the key of the ministering of angels. And then listen to this wording. It's almost like it lumps those others together. And the preparatory gospel, the key of the preparatory gospel, which includes that notion of, of baptism, repentance for the remission of sins. It's really quite wonderful. And I think the important thing about here is sometimes I, we may have a tendency to consider the Aaronic priesthood to be less or as not as important as. But when you read section 13 here, the power of the keys which are present are significant and um, in a way um, almost require us to give proper heed to that power. Um, for me, there's no doubt, Steve mentioned, what about the ministering of angels? I remember when I was a priest, our priest quorum advisor read a quote from Wilford Woodruff talking about when he was a priest, he was having revelations and visitations. And he said it almost in a way of, so what's wrong with you guys? How many have you had lately? And, and, and I was feeling badly. But then when you look at the notion of ministering of angels, that, that power, it's, well, Elder Oak said this, and I'll quote him. The ministering of angels can also be unseen. Angelic messages can be delivered by a voice or merely by thoughts or feelings communicated to the mind, close quote. He then goes on in this conference address where he talks about the Holy Spirit is, is part of that, and he ties it back into sacramental experiences where we promise that we may always have the Spirit to be with us, that it'll always be there. And for me, I started thinking, holy cow, this is important because look at what the Aaronic Priesthood does for me on a weekly basis, allows me to have opportunity of ministering of angels in its various forms and bring me closer through the sacrament to the gospel of the preparatory keys. Yeah, this preparatory priesthood is indispensable to get us to our ultimate That's right. goal, which is fullness of all the priesthood. Uh, the, the baptism administered by the preparatory priesthood, the sacrament, these are the ordinances that we can't go without on to further, uh, further life. And I think it's interesting that, for instance, for young Aaronic priesthood holders, they don't really require a lot of revelation to pass the sacrament or revelation to bless the sacrament or even revelation to baptize. Once you know the prayer, why you can do that. But my goodness, as they advance to the Melchizedek priesthood, start giving people blessings, whoa, all of a sudden there's a need for more revelation. I was thinking as, as we were talking about uh, angels speaking by the power of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> 
the ministering of angels may be more tied to the Spirit and the Holy Ghost than we acknowledge, too. Well, and their ministry is, not an, uh, is again, no different than when we spoke of John's ministry right. to preach repentance mm -hmm. in Moroni 7, uh, verses 29, but, but especially verse 31. And the office of their ministry is to call men unto repentance and fulfill and do the work of the covenants of the Father. Uh, the ministering of angels are to invite people to Christ, as, as is mm -hmm. the redundant mission for everyone. And, and yeah, I kind of like to tell my students, so if you become a ministering angel, suspect you're going to do many of the same things we do here. I, I think some of us may want to check out of home teaching by death, and I don't know that that'll happen. Mm -hmm. Our ministry remains the same. It's a constant ministry. Now, now look at the power here of the Aaronic Priest that we've been talking about. It's so powerful that in... In, in about four lines from the bottom of the verse, and this, meaning the Aaronic priest, these keys, this power we're talking about, shall never be taken again from the earth. I mean, there's a significance in that one. So when Melchizedek priesthood is restored, Joseph and Oliver, please understand that this has a very significant part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's part of it, and it shall never be taken from the earth. And then it goes on until the sons of Levi do come forth and offer their offering of righteousness. And it is interesting to read Oliver Cowdery's account of what the angel said, too, in the small print it at the end there, but it kind of changes the until. A well, he, he changes that. the word until to that, that. And, and both are indeed true, yeah. that, that the priesthood is upon the earth that we can fulfill these things, that, that we can continue forth in the restoration. These are powerful sections. They are, and, and, and I think what ties them together again is the preparation of Joseph to become the first elder of the church and Oliver to be the mm -hmm. second. It is significant that these two important inv individuals in the restoration are tied together in these revelations, receiving, as, as Matt suggested, line upon line, precept upon precept, and learning about administration of the gospel, learning about administration of ordina ordinances, uh, uh, even learning about the transition of keys by those who hold the tangible right. body and are able to lay hands on. And I think that's a, a important uh, to the readers to understand that, that they, they do have a tie. And together they have seen an angel. Thank you. Visit our website to find out more about the Doctrine and Covenants. Go to byubroadcasting.org. Funding for this program was provided in part by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University.